Writing in Beyond Nationalism But Not Without It, Ashanti Austin frames his thoughts in the following epigraph by Audre Lorde. We've been taught either to ignore our differences or to view them as causes for separation and suspicion rather than as forces for change. Without community, there is no liberation. Only the most vulnerable and temporary armistice between an individual and her oppression. But community must not mean a shedding of our differences, nor a pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist. Moving through Ashanti's intentional and critical engagement with anarchism, he situates the socio-political worldview in an African context in his article towards a vibrant and broad African-based anarchism where he provides an important port of entry to expand the work that others such as Sam Mba, L.E. Ogure, and the Nigerian Awareness League have provided as the foundational premise of expanding dominant expressions of anarchism as a socio-political frame that can guide or more appropriately further radical and revolutionary thought. In fact, Ashante highlights the fact that ideas and concepts that anarchism and anarchists wrestle with such as, but not limited to, communalism, non-binary conceptualizations of gender and the role of the individual in relation to the community, to society, and direct democracy are fundamental and inherent in the indigenous African sociopolitical and cultural fabric. Ashanti Omawali Austin, revolutionary, speaker, writer, organizer, political theorist, is one of the few former members of the Black Panther Party who identifies as an anarchist within the Black Liberation Movement. As a result of his membership in both the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army, he served a total of 14 years as a political prisoner and prisoner of war. He has visited the Zapatista Movement, organized with anarchist people of color, and the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, and is currently on the steering committee for the National Jericho Movement to Free U.S. Political Prisoners. Ashanti has authored a number of chapters, articles, pamphlets, and given talks and lectured around the world. Some of his work has appeared in Anarcho-Blackness, Notes Toward a Black Anarchism, Childhood, and the Psychological Dimension of Revolution, Black Anarchism, A Reader, Let Freedom Ring, a collection of documents from the movements to free U.S. political prisoners, Anarchist Panther, Journal of Prisoners on Prison, and no, against adult supremacy, to name a few. Concepts and ideas that frame this present discussion are centered on autonomy, the impact and influence of the black power movement on the Zapatistas, the role of land as a fundamental component of liberation, visions of freedom. Where are we now and where are we headed in terms of an organized collective front? And this in relationship to the necessity to build a program of action that can sufficiently counter the present conditions of our global world order. Using some of Ashanti's work, such as towards a vibrant and broad African-based anarchism, what's a black man doing here in Zapatista land, journey into the Mississippi of Mexico, and beyond nationalism, but not without it. We set the terms of engagement that will undoubtedly frame future conversations where we think black out loud in public space. Critical engagement with knowledge production and intentional exploration of radical ideas are a necessary component to materializing the freedom dreams of those who came before those who chose or were called to struggle for a different world. For Ashanti, our struggles are not just against capitalism. Too simple. Our struggles are not just against racism. That's also too simple. There are all kinds of negativisms we are fighting against, and just as important all kinds of worlds we are fighting for. That's why the whole idea and practice of convergence and spokes councils are so important to activists in general to learn from and enhance because they are thinking about making space for all voices to be heard and factored into the decision making. So whatever activities come forth from it prefigures the kind of new worlds we truly want. Ashanti goes on to write to my folks of color come in vision. Envision a world of worlds within our world where there's principled coexistence within the wonderful diversity of the black community. Harlems, Spanish Harlems, Watts, hip hop communities, villages of the Carolina coast, college communities, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender communities, Zulu nation, new African religious communities that come together mainly on Saturdays or Sundays, squatter communities, outlaw communities, comedic communities, Igbo, Ghanaian, Sierra Leonean, Ethiopian, Rasta neighborhoods, nomadic poet artist tribes, 
And then those of us who just be plain ignorant and harmless and crazy when we have to be and fun loving and like to journey through and between communities and sometimes just create new mixed ones. What if and how? Ella Baker said, we can do it if we just trust ourselves and get away from leadership led revolution. Kwesi Balagoon said, we can do it if we are willing to create a chaos that will shut this mother down. Audrey Lord said, we can do it if we learn to love and respect our beautiful diversity and reject the tools of our oppressors. Harriet Tubman said, ain't a better way to live than at war for a righteous cause. And France Renan said, if we smack that mother across the face, drive that pig out of our territory at gunpoint, it is liberating for our soul. Through the imagination, all is possible. Our show is produced today in solidarity with the Native, Indigenous, African, and Afro-descended communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Listen intently, think critically, act accordingly. Enjoy the program. at the white cars, you know. Um, but then there was another another day, maybe the next day, it was a certain calmness in this one black car, I mean, I'm talking about black color car, driven by black folks on the top of the hood, written in large letters, black power. Mm. I'm like, wow. And it made me proud, made me feel proud, proud. And it made me feel like, I want to be a part of the struggle. I want to be a part of those who are willing to stand up and fight and do what these brothers and sisters is doing. But so now it's like, I want to read more because I wasn't a great reader, but now I was able to get a hold of Black Power by Stokely Carmichael. Um, and at some point, die nigga die, H. Rap Brown. So then you're talking about me, who's not a great reader, but engaging in these books now and got to have a dictionary sometimes. And But I want to understand the concept now. What is so important about this Black Power concept as a way of looking at your reality and to hearing the words of Stokely and others who are putting the United States and our experience within the United States in an anti-colonial perspective. I'm like, wow, because we wasn't taught none of this stuff in school, but to put it in that perspective, then it makes sense of what your individual in the moment encounters with the police or with the governing officials. It makes sense now that this is a historical thing here, you know, and to be able to now understand what they mean by slavery. What do they mean by like discrimination and segregation? Okay, this is a bigger fight back than maybe our momentary engagements understood. And who and and Stokely and them and then the Black Panther Party gave me more of an, an understanding of the need to organize. Stokely was like really big on organize, organize, organize. And the Panthers, when it came time that we found out about the Panthers, the Panthers was also talking about standing up and fight, but then they threw in other terms, socialism, you know, uh, and books like Karl Marx and uh, Mao Zedong's uh, Red Book, Franz Fanon, no one could pronounce his last name right, but man, we was like as difficult as Fanon was, the dictionary was right there and the study groups allowed us to like be engaged in conversations with the different viewpoints and stuff. Um, so this is this is like me going through this period and the more that I understood how complicated this struggle was, how many other layers was there and what the role of these institutions were, I wanted to be involved with more Black Power Movement organizing and then Black Panther Party 
organizing. And in my hometown, in, in my closest friend, Jihad, who's uh, uh, one of the co-chairs of the National Jericho Movement, we, we grew up together. We wanted to know more and his father wanted to know more. And so here we are, we going from Plainfield to Newark. We going from Plainfield to New York City, to Jersey City, sometimes to, a, a, I think maybe Atlantic City and stuff, but to see what Panthers was doing. And we was able to learn by going there and, and them allowing us to be involved with the different organizing, encouraging us to read, 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 uh, help sell the newspaper, to see the role of, of, of the newspapers and helping to fund the, you know, the organizing programs. It was like some, it was tremendous. And I, I think it, I say that because it, made me feel that sense of what we can do you know that kind of uh uh internal excitement you know mm -hmm. and different from what we had been going through in this country because i'll tell people like when you are like indoctrinated with the i don't i don't, i'm not sure about how you can use the word i say nigger mm -hmm. you know that nigger attitude I mean, I mean, Cornell West would say the niggerization of something, something, mm -hmm. something. So I think I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what that meant was that we was also being challenged not to be mm -hmm. this niggerized person, not to be like despondent, depressed, uh, accepting your situation, you know. And man, that was just like, once I was on that path, it was, and you see other people, you realize that you're part of something that is very broad mm -hmm. and you get a sense of the historical moment. And it's really great to be in it. It's really great. I wanted to pull on something and, and, and thank you for sharing that, sharing that back, uh, you know, the background. One of the things I wanted to pull on out of, out of, the, out of what you're saying is, is that the realization of moving and when you use the if you when you're using the term the the n-word or the nigger term that's also an individualization mm -hmm. uh and it seems to me that there was a collective process that is going here you talk about your friend jihad that collective process and engaging and thinking together about the moment but also you mentioned possibilities of freedom the possibilities mm -hmm. of moments that are not seen at the moment that are not there at the moment. Right. They're also they're also you're, they're forming. So there's a there's a there's possibilities of freedom mm -hmm. that is also merged to a long tradition of fighting of resisting mm -hmm. those particular. So it seems to me that the that what's happening here, you know, is that this you're breaking out of this individualistic mindset. You're moving right. into it. You know, could you speak a little bit more about the context of that? That you know, the collective processes of study, the collective processes of engaging in organization efforts. Right. I can, man. I can think of uh, times at home because uh, Malcolm X, from the autobiography to Malcolm X speaks. I read them. I would read so much that I'd be in the living room. And no, normally you're in the living room, everybody watching television. And my father would just, sometimes he would get so angry at me because I'm not like participating in the television. With, with, with what, three to six channels, you know, but that was our thing, right? And he would see me reading Malcolm X. And I'm just stuck, man. Malcolm is just providing me with so much information, awareness. And, and but my father was like, why can't you be like you used to be? What happened? What's happening here? And sometimes he'd be like, get out of the living room. Just go somewhere. And I'm like, OK, listen, my father was an ex prize fighter, so I don't mess around and stuff. But um, it was things like that, that, like the books. I'm still a book person today, you know, the books and what I was getting from this reading process at the same time that I am engaged in movement stuff increasingly. And so it was it was from there that, um, you know, I think even more than I even understood at the time, a lot of it is like in reflection. Um, the more I read and understood, the more that it allowed me to increase my participation 
like in reading France Fanon. And when France Fanon would talk about situations in Algiers, like on the street corners or, or in them so-called dangerous hood areas, as far as you know how he was described, and how black folks would turn on each other or the alcoholism and stuff like that. It made sense that in Plainfield, where I live, the same things were happening, you know? But what did it mean when there was the engagement of the anti-colonial struggle, the liberation struggle? And in our sense, it was groups like Nation Islam, Black Panther Party, Emir uh, Baraka's group, you know, that, and all this might be more East Coast, you know, but what did it mean when folks in the, on the corners now was getting engaged? What did it mean when I was engaging? Um, I, I think the, the thing for me, it was that the connection between the readings that helped me to understand the situation from historical processes and then later on from psychoanalysis and, and, and analytical perspective that brought in psychologies and, uh, and other cultural matters, man, I'm like, it made it more complex, but it also made it more, uh, um, I'm not sure the word, but- we we'll say readable. Can, readable. It's re yes. Readable. Yeah. And and the, and the thing was, yeah, okay, we can do this. Yeah, this is a, this is an empire. Yes, this is an anti-colonial struggle. Yes, the police are an occupying army in our communities. Yes, that made it clearer to me what we were facing and how we wanted to keep broadening and deepening deepening that understanding so that we wouldn't, as Malcolm say, get bamboozled. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that for me kept me in it, you know, and I wanted to know more I, and 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 from a, a field worker. I mean, I was I was not leadership, never was really enjoyed the work in the community. Um, and, and I think the thing even about that was now you are interacting with folks in the community who are still trapped in that mindset. But when they see you doing this work, they may take a chance themselves into wanting to find out more about what you're doing and what you're about. If they see this, like we had a free lunch program because we started in the summer in Plainfield. First, the kids are there. They don't mind the kids coming, but sometimes that also uh, give them permission, they give themselves permission to come into the office yourself, come to the program yourself. And you having conversations with them now from say like this Panther perspective and to see folks come and be and, and then want to help. Oh my God, all the things about, we can't do this, we can't do that. We will never come together. We ain't shit, you know. All this you can see begins to crumble in the community. So in that sense, you ain't just talking about Panthers, you talking about a whole black culture that's in this period of transformation and how uh, intoxicating in great ways it can be. You're walking down the street, you hear the bus going by and somebody throws out the black power fist and you throw up yours. We all got these Afros going on. We all got these dashikis and other African clothes and changing our names. Wow. <laughs> so it, it gives you that sense that nothing is impossible, but, but it's all really connected to you. you gotta really follow your desire to wanna know more mm -hmm. and then to want to do more. Because I'm gonna tell you, man, the more, the deeper you understand this empire and what it, it has done to us and still does, your anger level is gonna shoot through the roof. But your reading is also telling you that there's a necessity for discipline in the way that you do things, you know, that you just can't go off, you know, cause you're angry in the moment, that this is a long-term struggle. And here comes the understandings of the, the Vietnamese, Right. And then the, the Irish Republican movement, you know, 
we talk about 400 years, the Irish Republican movement fighting 800 years, the British, you know. So we can imagine what some of them revolutionaries in Ireland now feel about the Queen, right? <laughs> no, man, the Queen ain't gonna be no glorious person. You're the head of the empire. But for us, it was telling us it's gonna be long term and we're gonna have to buckle down for that. And that even, even if you if you feel like our generation is not gonna do it, you got to prepare for the next generation to take it on. That Vietnamese struggle against the United States was so important in understanding stuff like that. And I'm and and even me, this this is before I'm I'm uh me and Jihad are even out of high school. <laughs> We're getting this anti-war movement. That's why the Vietnamese struggle was so important, fighting against U.S. colonialism. Uh, so, and I mean, like, I'm still that person to this day. I read because I want to understand how we can win, you know, and, and what we're willing to do in order to win. And that's not always the the more machismo stuff like the fight with weapons, mm -hmm. that is just uh, even maybe more important is, as Amil Cabral will say, the struggle within. You, what will you do to change within in order to be this person who can bring all your gifts, all your potential into this struggle that helps you in a collective effort to overthrow these oppressions that we suffer no you i mean you, you can't believe you you just filled up my two pages of notes there's so many mm. things that you, that you said you know but i'll, I'll try to i'll try to keep it compact and calm okay. as you know as possible one of the things that you're talking about in this reading process is that you know um apollo friere in, in pedagogy of the press and um also in, in the work that he was doing in the context of reading reading is also related you know, the reading on words on page is related directly to reading the world. And the language that you're looking for is a language of genealogy. How do we map what we're doing in a tradition in the processes of understanding that there has been fights consistently? You mentioned the 800 year struggle. You mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, and we're going to move into the Zapatistas. We're going to move into how do we understand you know, the genealogy. So the reading is also moving you to what also we would consider to be a, a, a polo free everybody. And also I do a lot of writing on critical consciousness, how to move one's awareness to actually doing something right. about being aware. Right. And that's what it seems like that you're doing. And just to also add another point in here, you mentioned your friend, you know, your best friend, Jihad. Jihad is also a term that means, but people think about it as a struggle right. external, but it is a struggle internally right. first to right. understand how you, could you talk a little bit more about the internationalism? You mentioned anti-colonialism. So you're, you're becoming, you're becoming very, very much aware of what's happening in the world as well. Yeah. You mentioned, the, you know, the Viet Cong, you know. All right, that. right. That, I, I think that was a, the Black Panther newspaper played a big part and then being able to get other movement newspapers at the time because at the time there was so many movement newspapers that would help you to understand the international situation but the black panther newspaper it's like we were required to read that newspaper from front page to the back page before even selling it um and so in the process you're learning about these other struggles um the the struggle of the Vietnamese people became very important because it was so resourceful. Reading Mao's uh, little red book and the military writings and stuff, you, it, it was also learning about the Chinese revolution. Reading Kim Il-sung, uh, Juche uh, concepts and stuff, you learned more about the, the North the Korean struggle uh, uh, against their oppressors. And so all this stuff was coming in. And, and because like the, the desire to know more about Africa was so important, you're learning more about these African liberation struggles. You know, like I took my name, uh, um, my first name, uh, which Jihad will remember is Omawali, you know, and, and still sometimes he or some of my older comrades from Plainfield will call me Omawali. Um, and Omawali, uh, uh, Nigerian, 
and it means the uh, um, the child who has come home. And I wanted that name because I felt like I was coming home to the revolution, to the struggle, right? And it's an important thing that everyone has to do if you're going to like uh, be in this struggle in a, in a in a real fundamental way. And then the, and then uh, the Ashanti reading um, W.B. Du Bois, uh, The World in Africa, and reading about the struggles of the Ashanti nation against the British, and the, and the fact that uh, uh, they fought the British in six wars and was able to defeat them until the last one because the British overwhelmed them with, with the military technology and stuff. I wanted that because it was resistance, the willingness to continue to resist, resist, resist. But in the process, I learned about the struggle in Ghana. I learned about Kwame Nkrumah. These is my folks. I, and, and I mean, in all of Africa, this is our folks that we have been deprived of knowing through this white supremacist empire, you know, and but then to find the information that connects you. And that whole connection with Africa has such a spiritual, strong spiritual content when you realize that they have made this continent seem like it's just a it's just a jungle of ignorant savages. And to realize that you come from a, a very rich place with many people that have contributed so much from Egypt down to South Africa, you know, from the East Coast to West Coast. For me, it, it again was giving me new parts to who I am in this world. And then the, the, when you learn about the liberation struggles, Malcolm used to talk about them and, and I used to underline so much in Malcolm's books, but now I'm learning how to do some research. If it talks about the struggle of the, uh, of the, uh, um, of the South Africans, or if it talks about the Angolans or the Mozambique, I want to know more about them struggles. And then because of the Panthers and many people want to know the Panthers, sometimes you get to meet some of these people from other countries. I remember meeting people from Japan <coughs> and South Africa and some other places. And you know now that it ain't just you locally, this is people globally who are fighting different kinds of imperial oppressions and class struggles and, and, and all other kinds of different things, that you, and which includes you know, the women fighting you know, against sexism in their own struggles. Um, all of this becomes very challenging because man, I, it's like, oh man, I didn't know it was like that. You know, I, I, you know like the British, or the Portuguese or the Italians, you know, they're doing all this stuff, but they're able to buy off people. And Daruba used to talk about, it, still talks about it a lot in terms of there's that class of your own people that are willing to compromise or work with their oppressors. And it's really against the interests of your liberation because they want to just fit in. So at the time, you know, all these struggles is teaching me so much, uh, but it's also showing me that we are really not just local, that what's going on is really global. And it just fortifies you more to want to continue and to believe in the possibility of victory. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that part was so important to me that, man, we can actually win. You would have uh, Leila Khalid, um, Palestinian uh, revolutionary, uh, uh, not PLO, not the Palestinian Liberation Organization, but one of the other more radical ones. She hijacks a plane once. Uh, they take her to prison. She gets out through the power of the Palestinian struggle and hijacks another one. She becomes so important just as being a woman uh, taking this kind of operation on and showing that whatever the empire got, their massive planes, technology, you can take them and make them do as you will, you know? 
And it showed me that um, we can, from individual operations to larger, we can do what we choose to do. And, and, and that, that consciousness played a part later on when, when I'm underground and we're trying to get some folks out of Manhattan House of Detention. It's like, oh yeah, we can do this. That our attitude, we can do. Even as guerrillas, we can do. But even as a community organizer, you already sense, you know, from that time my mother took my hand, you know, on that march, ordered all the junior highs and high schools marched down the city hall and demanded uh, black history and got it the next school year. We can do, you know, that that thing. There's nothing that we can't, you know. Uh, do the impossible is one of them expressions that was so big. Um, but it showed us that people have been struggling all over the world, but also you do find out that our own struggle, it, it just ain't start here, that it did start on that continent and that we fought every inch of the way, every inch of the way. And it is so great to know that. I think the only difference for me now is to understand in terms of the psychology of conquest, you know, like not everybody fought back, you know, uh, what did it mean for those who didn't or what did it mean for those who did but were captured and not killed and, and was con uh, you still put them in the process of enslavement. What did it do to the psyche? What did it do to the spirit? You know, so that part, I think that was in my later years and now it's like, I want to understand more of that process because that also is going to help me figure out some different ways that I might want to engage people today different from back then, you know, because then you then you get what why Emil Carl Gabral would say certain things or James and Grace Lee Bob's writings or uh, some of the radical psychologies they want to help you to understand how do you reach those who still fear freedom, who fear liberation, you know, because this is now 400 years. It ain't an easy process. And, and it feeds into also how, you know, like even when we deal with today, sexualities and stuff, and, and, and a lot of my, my nationalist brothers and sisters, uh, I feel like, uh, uh, we still have to challenge ourselves in terms of like, we don't wanna work with people that uh, have this kind of sexuality or that's kind of, or they just, they, they, they change who they are and stuff like that. I'm, this is my daughter. I'm on this thing, girl. Hold on, can we have, can I have Robin for lunch? Yes, but when I finish, you, you, can, you can edit that part. Anyhow, so, but, that same process was then because I, I mean, back then, if you're fighting in the streets back in, the, in 67, it's a certain understanding. You're frustrated, you're angry. But then when the ideology comes and the analysis comes, you, 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 you can understand why organization and certain kinds of organizations become important. Behavior becomes important. How we interact with each other becomes important, you know? So, the, so the, here's this whole thing. How was the African liberation movements? How did they deal with personal relations? How did they deal with the compromises? All this stuff you wanna know. And sometimes it, uh, it has to be your own. You gotta go through some things yourself and then deepen your understandings and you go back and say, oh man, we could have did this better. We could have did that better. No, no, one of the things I wanted to pull on, um, and you mentioned this and I don't think, uh, we pay enough attention to it or we kind of separate it. You mentioned the spiritual awakening moving through Africa, right? Mm -hmm. As you're starting to realize that the weakness of empire is awakening, you know, the, the, the intellectuals is stimulating you intellectually. It's also motivating you to engage and in, in, in facilitating the, the rupture of the empire as it's right. coming apart. You know, could you talk a little bit more about, you know, the fundamental restructuring of the relationships that we have to with ourselves, the environment, and also people 
But also, as you're talking about, as you're trying to figure out the psychological aspect of people who didn't engage in struggle, what did mm -hmm. that do? This is moving into the realm of Fanon, right? This is moving into the realm of a colonizer colonized, right? Maybe, right. You know, those type of things. Could you talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, the spiritual awakening that I think is important that is also simultaneously to being awakening, you know, based upon one's intellectual engagement with empire? Mm -hmm. Right. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I I think that uh, some of the, the kind of simpler things is around uh, how because we have been in this empire for so long, we don't realize how much we are a part of it until you start to kind of open up your consciousness and in every opening of the consciousness should lead to even your body. <laughs> feeling this, you know, um, and from the simple things like, you know, how we began to change the way that we dressed, change the way that we walked and talked with each other, or uh, uh, holding on to some of the things. We always had a sense of, you know, like that thing of brother and sister and stuff, but now in the political realm, to call somebody brother or sister, you know, it had an added meaning now. It was like, uh, uh, it was it was almost a sense of, seeing ourselves as a people, and as some might say, as a nation within, uh, just because of what this experience being in this empire has meant, you know, to us, it makes you feel good. It makes you begin to accept more of who you are in the world, you know, of being, being in the world. That could be understood philosophically. Um, so, so I think what was happening with us was was that um, that good feeling began to get, I, I think, nurtured by so many others you saw moving in similar directions. Uh, whether it was in your locale or whether it was what you started to see on television, uh or your your it seemed like at some point folks was beginning to travel to like to cuba and the other african liberation movements and 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 to north korea and to china uh but man that i i think that african thing <laughs> oh because they told you and had us believing for so long that there was something wrong with that you know and now man the the different colors of our skin, textures of our hair, nose, features, lips, and all this stuff. It's like, oh, yeah, this is beautiful. You know, this is beautiful. And, and, and it started to filter in the way that we started to raise our kids. There's something going on here, you know, but at the same time, you know, the system is gonna do things to try to frustrate even that type of stuff too, with their power over media, different forms of media and stuff like that. You know, um, so it was a constant battle. <sighs> I, I, I think that, um, I, I think it allowed us to start uh, seeing ourselves as active agents maybe, you know, in the struggle, but it had, it had other, limitations i guess or shortcomings because a lot of the black nationalist uh theorizings then was kind of trapped in which you later kind of understand as some kind of like european concepts nation and all this other stuff uh what's a man what's a woman you know and uh what's the proper relationships the proper ways to express ourselves even in terms of our sexuality like i don't think that uh we saw that back then so we could tend to have all male dominated organizations or very uh patriarchal family structures um stuff like that uh and you had to you had to really struggle with them issues and a lot of times because we didn't have uh maybe enough understandings a lot of times we lost them struggles in terms of the patriarchy that was still within the black movements and stuff like that and and the fbi though i feel was right there knowing how to pick them contradictions that uh if they played on with the infiltration and other techniques and with the media uh culture and stuff uh, 
how to make us frustrate our own efforts to be free because we didn't realize that you know we hold on to some shit that is really destructive uh and that and that for and this a lot of this is me understanding this in prison mm -hmm. in prison mm -hmm. sundiato coley would say um who's who's finally out of prison um he would say turn that prison into a, your university mm -hmm. And so that for me was like, oh man, I love to read. So I don't even care that I'm in prison. I don't care that I'm in say, give me my books. So if you take them, that's okay too. But in prison, having access to uh, radical books from radical psychologies to critical theory, um, uh, even in, in later on in, in the anarchisms and stuff like that, it gave me opportunities to look at my own past experience differently and to see how our limitations uh limited it, it held us back and also allowed counterintelligence program and others to play on those more destructive tendencies within our movements and we and it could look like we're just destroying ourselves mm -hmm. Yeah. No, this is an important point, and you you led right up to the you know the, the shift in the conversation that we want to deal with some of the you know the nationalisms, the autonomy, uh, and the and the anarchy. Like this particular process, this is moving your intellectual development. So, what we just set up, you know, for our listeners to really understand was a robust, really multi layered. Uh, you know, that moved you into organizational expressions, right? Because you mentioned the Panthers, you mentioned all of this is moving and developing your consciousness to be a critical, to do something, because you are also seeing uh, the ability of empire, you're seeing the weaknesses of empire. So mm -hmm. this moves you to organizational expressions, of course, in the middle of this, you mentioned prison, could you talk a little bit about this, this shift uh, in your sociopolitical development, I should say, I shouldn't say a shift, an evolution because you're building mm -hmm. on you're building on this background you're building on this this collective process as you're moving into could you talk a little bit about the organizational expressions in which you were involved in and how you were articulating all of this in a material but at the same time you're doing both you're, mm -hmm. you're developing intellectually so you're, your political programs you're doing this not just individually but collectively as well right. 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 And then you move and then prison, of course, prison becomes one of these catalysts, right? These 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 accelerators. Right. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about about that? And then we'll move into a little bit of the discussion of what is autonomy and and of course your um your your writings on nationalism, but you know, an archaic, but without yeah, I'll get the title, I'll get the mm -hmm. title of that. Mm -hmm. But could you respond to what I just said and while I right. Can... right. I um I think I think that um, the organizational how it helped maybe me to maybe shift organizational approaches or my own within organizations was you come out of the Black Panther Party it you know coming out of the Black Panther Party it, it is a Marxist Leninist Maoist group at some point Kim Il Sung's writings was prominent and others you know uh, but in there, it allowed us to to learn uh, some of the basics of Marxism, like there's the dialectical method, there's the historical materialism. But the dialectical method for me became so important because it gave us a way to think more scientifically. It gave us a way to see the world in terms of contradictions and um, how things how things might change if you can understand more of the contradictory forces within a thing and this particular thing in terms of let's understand this empire let's understand capitalism but let's understand the class struggles and all this other stuff how does racism uh play a part in all of this um so and and so that helps you to understand like how you want to be in this organization how you want to perform within this organization you're 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 going to realize that you're going to learn a lot and in the process you're going to change a lot you know, so from the from the Panthers, though, and, and, and of course, you know, like, like there's a certain point, there was a split in the Black Panther Party, 1971. Very important for me because it was 
me and Jihad and others understanding that, you know, we got a beef with the leadership, you know, Huey Newton and the others, it was hierarchy for sure. Um, the power was all centralized with Huey and, and, and the crew in California. The, the Panther chapters and, 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 and me and Jihad was able to experience some of this right in New Jersey because we would go to the, um, the Jersey City office, the Newark office, go to the Harlem office and we see the effects of what happened when monies from the national leadership was not being sent back to the local chapters and the local chapters were suffering in terms of being able to pay rent or provide other services that, that had established the Black Panthers in that particular neighborhood or, or town or city. Um, but when the split happened, one of the things about those of us who opposed uh, the Huey Newton and them was that we wanted something more collective, you know? And uh, uh, because of what we felt was happening when everything was centralized with Huey, Bobby Seale and the rest. Now in, in, in prison, well, even before prison, there was the right on Black Panther newspapers. There was, there was no more mention of a central committee we wanted to get more into something that sounded collective. I'm not saying that it was anarchist, but I'm saying it was definitely a critique of what happens when all the power is up top, you know, and it kind of gets into the anarchist thing about what power does, it corrupts. In prison, me starting to read more of uh, anarchist stuff and even critical theory um, allowed me to, to see more of the dynamics of hierarchy, authoritarianism, and how it expresses itself in the individuals within an organization. So as I'm reading this in prison, man, I'm like, oh man, I begin to see like what, what happened when the leadership started getting more hierarchy and more hierarchy. It started getting more narrow and, and people who opposed it or were critical were getting kicked out. Geronimo and, and others, the Panther 21 were being expelled and all good people. So what we was doing within, this is in the ranks of the Black Liberation Army though, uh, is that we wanted structures that were veering away from that that allowed for us to have more say so, more participation, even within the prison. We were spread out all over the countries, but had a kind of a secret communications going. Um, those things helped me to see that if I was ever out of this prison, these prisons, I want to also be able to organize in more horizontal ways. And that, you know, the anarchist influence and stuff, which also meant that I had to be careful of my behavior within organizations with working with other people. And I know that even in the prisons, my relationship to other political prisoners or politicized prisoners changed. I was more willing to have a, a more non-political conversation just about life, you know, or to be able to talk about sexism or, or ask people about their, you know, or like some of the brothers would have these real rigid relationships with their female partners and i could ask questions now like like why is that so important that uh you know you know you have this kind of rigid relationship with her you know she's going through some issues just with you being locked up right it changed my conversation it changed the way that i related to others it was it was just not so political it was also personal so, so I, I knew that from there, that's the kind of things I wanted to do and the kind of uh, organizational work that I wanted to be engaged in. Uh, but it was all from what I'm reading. The radical psychologies, the feminist psychology was telling me a lot, oops, were telling me a lot about internalized oppression. It made Franz Fanon stuff even more important you know, because now I'm beginning to see that it ain't just, you know, the, the, the petty bourgeoisie collaborating, you know, with the colonizers is our behavior in relationships that also play a part. 
and how that has to be seen as political as well. You know, I, I mean, I was, I was reading some stuff that was shaking me up in terms of man's role in history. Uh, I was reading some, some, some feminist stuff that was like, it gave me a historical understanding of when did the ideas of even men being in charge, when did the transition happen for, from maybe matriarchy to patriarchy? you know, from female centered gods to male gods. And I'm like, oh, this is a long history here. So that's, that's why I said before, like sometimes even, you know, some of my nationalist brothers and sisters, I mean, we gotta deepen stuff. We gotta see how, are we just buying into some of the European ideas of nationalism and, and relations, you know, in the family or maybe just the family itself? What is a man? Can we challenge it? So getting out was also me looking for ways to work with people who are on that vibe. And um, that it kind of worked out OK sometimes. Sometimes it didn't. <laughs> but I'm persistent, yeah. you know, and then to find folks that uh, uh, who wanted to who wanted to challenge Black movement, mm -hmm. you know, in some of these areas from hierarchy to the sexisms, um, because we wanted full participation. Mm -hmm. that, and, and that basically what it want full participate, participation in that kind of respect. And, uh, you know, that you give to someone who is becoming your comrade, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And that means like, okay, if this person gay, that's okay. Is this person uh, uh, trans? That's okay. You know, what, what about me? I'm, I'm straight. Is there supposed to be something so fantastic about that? You know, can we figure out how to create that kind of world, Zapatistas, uh, where many worlds exist, right? And that has to manifest itself even in, in our most local dealings not just on the grander scale, like Zapatistas did that stuff, man, and we're offering so much wisdom, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I wanted, I wanted to, because uh, this is, this is, this is such a wonderful conversation. And I, uh, you know, what, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm seeing, the African indigenous knowledge systems and how it structures relationships is obviously running through here. So you're reading the historical, the pre-colonial, yeah. also the impact of the colonial. Fanon is also a lot of people talk about Fanon, but forget that chapter on nationalism. Right. <laughs> you right. know, that chapter, you right. know that, cha that chapter, you know, nationalism. And so this is also leading, you know, to you to writing, you know, you, you, you know, a number of particular things, but in particular, you know, beyond nationalism, but not without it. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're looking how to restructure. But you're pulling on these on these Africanisms or these deep rooted, right. you know, um, uh, uh, what we will call, you know, what we think about African indigenous knowledge systems, right? You know, and this is also moving into a critique, and critique is fine. Mm -hmm. Critique is fine of movement mm -hmm. and its relationship, you know, this relationship between autonomy uh, and the Black liberation movement, and how we actually can actually realize that. And this is obviously, you know, when you're moving and coming into contact and seeing, and we're 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 there. Are, we are moving. Uh, we're, we're truncating a lot of the history here right, because I want right. I want us to tease out these ideas because I want I really want to look at it in the context of autonomy, nationalism, and and what was the impact of the Zapatistas on your particular uh, thought process? Well. Um, Sort of be before the, the the Zapatista experience, I'm still reading like because I'm into a lot of uh, I'm really moved by the anarchist stuff I'm finding, and the anarchist stuff is giving me so much insight into different struggles that were not hierarchical, top down, and were more horizontal. Um, so I'm like, oh man, this is all new thing because you just kind of assume like, well, we need leaders. And you just kind of don't question that. Well, the leaders tend to be men, so you know. But now it's like, no, we can challenge that. There are different ways of organizing. But one of the struggles that I, uh, in in Africa, um, Nigeria, 
amongst the Igbo and the Igbo fighting the British. And there's a certain point where um, the, the Igbo women feel like the men are not doing enough. And they decide they're going to step up and take the leadership, you know? And they begin to, to organize and fight in ways that was part of their cultural tools. One of them was something called standing on a man. And they would surround what they would do in, in certain protests against the British and them Igbo flunkies working with the British was to surround them, their house or hut, whatever, so that they couldn't even get out to perform their functions. And it was called standing on a man. And it was just like they were surrounded and, and it prevent them from being able to even go to whatever, you know, they needed to go to fulfill their, their uh, collaborating functions or their imperial functions. That also uh, allowed me to see that there was other struggles in Africa that was, uh, and, and what the thing about the, the evil one that it, it was, it was horizontal. Um, Zebo had a thing about every man a king or something like that. So I'm not saying they're necessarily perfect in terms of the you know sex, you know women and stuff, but it was definitely uh, allowed for more participation from people so that it wasn't just one way top down. It had to go that way, but it allowed for different expressions. Then I learned about others. So while all this is happening, and it's so funny too because. I have my periods ups and downs, which is when I say ups and downs, another way of saying depression, right? And there's times when I'm like, oh man, I don't think this, the next generation is going to take this thing and carry it. They keep seeming to get bought in, they kind of buy into it and get bamboozled. And, and then next thing you know, here we are again. So I'm on one of my low periods. I'm like depressed. And then all of a sudden things happen. <clears throat> 1994, I think, January 1st, maybe, the Zapatista uprising. Now, the Zapatistas are basically Mayan people, right? And been fighting the Spaniards and others for 500 years. Now, all of a sudden, they, have be, they had 10 years of secretly organizing and they have taken their stand. And they've taken it in a way that is just amazing. Uh, because it's not like really like they got standing armies and stuff, but they are really basing a lot of their resistance on like uh, their own Mayan tools. And also those who come from the universities and stuff who was involved with some more intellectual revolutionary thinkings in there. Um, and so a lot of us wanted to know like, how are they doing this? Uh, what makes it so different? Why are they, you know, like the participation of women seem to be like key in here. It's like really high. Um, so some of us was able to go to Mexico and to the uh, Chiapas, which is the basic area where the Zapatistas got, cause they have now got control of massive amounts of lands. And the Mayan peoples are the ones who are taking control of this. And even the intellectuals in there, like uh, Subcomandante Marcos, uh, submit to the leadership of the Mayan people. They just bring their intellectual gifts, but their intellectual gifts are not seen as more important than the Mayan people's gifts. They're there to be a part of the struggle. And even that relationship for me was like, oh, wow. Then that means like, just because, you know, we got this analysis, we don't have to be the big brains. We, we're just offering our gifts like everybody else is. So when we go there, we're able to see some of this and we're able to see Zapatistas controlling land. So when you talk about autonomy and stuff, they're controlling their lands in defiance of the Mexican government, in defiance of the Mexican government's relationship to the US empire, you know, 
And they're all they're, the empire and the Mexican government are in collaboration to try to frustrate these things. But so far, this movement is so uh, community based and so based in that Mayan culture that they can't shake it. When you go there, you meet you 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 got to ask for permission to go into a community. You got to tell them why you're coming. Uh, but then once they allow you in, you're able to see the inner workings of a people who it's been 500 years, they have taken control of their land and they are growing their own food. They're defending this land. Um, they're developing their own relationships, not only within Mexican society with folks who are potential allies, but internationally. <clears throat> and what it showed me was that what they're doing can be, I guess, translated into our situation, definitely just not the same way, because we don't come from communities like that, but we're in neighborhoods, we're in cities, we're in places like Jackson, Mississippi, that's 80% black, you know, <clears throat> the potential of us being able to take control, like the Black Power Movement had originally said, is a possibility. But with the awareness that you got to defend what you take. And with the Zapatistas, the military part was not like the dominating part. It was the, the, the coming together of these Mayan people who were willing to like, even with their bodies, push the military out. You'll see some iconic pictures of, a, of one community where the, 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 the Mayan women are physically pushing the Mexican soldiers out of their community. And I'm like, oh my God, there are so many ways of fighting back. Fighting back is, is, is how they grow their corn. Fighting back is how they raise their kids. Fighting back is how they determine their relationships with, with others outside of their community. <clears throat> Fighting back is how they make space for women's participation, you know? So there's, there was times when we was at a conference in Chiapas, one of the communities, and you see all these people coming in and what's different about them, they all got different dress on outfits on i'll say men and women the, and it all was like if they're dressed a certain way they're from a certain community if they're dressed another way they're from another community but it's not just individuals it is families coming and it would tell me again how our struggle here has got to get back to where it's families coming you know on our terms you know in in, in, our, in our terrain you know, but they, they, they were like, <clears throat> they came as families, they camped right there and they made decisions. And the, and the decision-making process was this thing that could sometimes take several days to make decisions. So hierarchy is like, no, you're gonna make a quick decision. With the Zapatistas, it was like, well, listen, you know, we're gonna do a lot of arguing. We're gonna do a lot of stuff. We're gonna come out here on one page. And so we would see this. And for many of us where the anarchism was more theoretical, we got to see like, it can get kind of messy, but that messiness is necessary. You know, it ain't supposed to be smooth. It ain't supposed to be that. No, we come from different places. But now they're showing that, no, we can do this. And, and we're going to take the time to do it with everybody's participation. And when we come out of here, we got a plan. And this is how we're going to do this. So coming back to the United States, you know, it was like we're, we're just so inspired. And we want to do similar things, but it's like, how do we do it in the United States, in our communities that look nothing like the Zapatistas community, that we're not Mayan? So the key is, how do we get our own gifts? And, it's, and it sort of leads to the, 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 my thing around, um, you know, um, black nationalism, beyond black nationalism, but not without it. 
because I don't want to be a part of no struggle that don't recognize who I am, right? But I also know that there are things about us that are detrimental that we've held on to in our uh, colonized, con conquered experience here. So I wanted, like with the like with the Mayan peoples, like they don't give up their Mayan culture, but they are willing to. Uh, embrace those revolutionary concepts that seem to work in their benefit. That's where you get the Subcomandante Marcos and the others from the universities, you know. So that kind of thinking uh, can happen for us here. My anarchism, and I say mine because I drew a lot on jazz and the uh, and started to see how that jazz, that improvisation was so anarchist, you know, and how it's bringing in, being open to the different influences, the different personalities, the different experiences, that's key, instead of blocking them out and making your struggle so narrow that, you know, like when the, I think it's the Chinese say that women hold up half the sky, that you put in restrictions on women's participation. So even from that, the, the things we learned from the Zapatistas is always, how can our struggle stay creative? How can it be jazz-like, you know? How can it be like an ensemble of outlaws and spirits and, you know, but really grounded in the, in the very everyday things that we do to survive and to uh, be able to grow in terms of, I guess, a, a political expression that where we actually are moving towards the liberationary steps or uh, projects that takes us further to the hilltop, you know? Yeah. No, no, I, I, this just ringing in my mind right now is Alma Kaur Cabral, Return to the Source. Mm. You know, this notion of, you know, and also this, this idea of, an intrinsic value in African indigenous ways of being and forms of knowledge is polyrhythmicity, meaning that mm -hmm. it's the ability to express uh, multiple ways right. simultaneously, right. but it's all moving for the benefit of the collective. Yes. And that expresses itself in a very creative and innovative process. Right. I, often, I often say, and, and we'll wrap up, I, I, we have to wrap up because okay. I don't, you know, because <laughs> I, I mean, we could be here all day, but I'm just reminded of one of the things that I say, and, and Robert D.G. Kelly writes about this notion of the radical imagination. And one of the things I often say is that uh, one of the things that colonizers do is they do a few things, control and redescribe or redefine what time means mm -hmm. as a relationship to what a human means that also has a direct relationship on our imaginations. Mm. You know, so if you if you could respond to <laughs> respond to that as we kind of put a pause in this conversation, because I know you have to go, I have to go. I, I, um, I want you to reframe that a bit. That was a reframe what you just okay. said. So one of the things one of the things I was thinking about in the context of uh, of what uh, 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 colonizers are, are being able to colonize the mind is that, you know, really arresting the way that we look at time, right, which makes it a very hierarchical, very forceful process that you only have a minimum amount of time to do a minimum amount of things, which yeah. also has a direct relationship on us addressing issues as you talked about the, the the collective process, if it takes mm -hmm. a few days. Malcolm talked about this, Ahaj Malik Shabazz, when we go behind closed doors, we can hash it out, do what we need to do when we come right. out, we in a united front. Right. And the second thing was, that was, you know, that, that redefining of time also has to do with a redefinition of what it means to be human. Right. This is all coming from a, a very narrow European perspective right. of how, you know, the world, which also has a direct relationship on our imaginations, being able to see and imagine and mm -hmm. fight for and believe in and know that another world yeah. can be reconstructed 
uh, based upon these fictitious notions of race, these fictitious notions of gender, these very limiting notions of what family and community are. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are the types of things you know that that I'm hearing. You know, okay. I'm, I've actually pulled that from what you said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In in relation to, I'm kind of working on these. You know, trying to work these out myself. Right. Um. You know. You know, because I'm I'm in a classroom. I'm charged with being in front of young minds. And mm -hmm. one of the things I, I try to do and uh, is really expand this notion of classroom, mm -hmm. uh, expand that the learning process is not just in this institutional space, yeah. but yeah. also let's use our imagination. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out how to tap into the creative. And so what I'm saying here is that, I mean, there's some synergy you know, and what you're doing in the context of what you have done and what you're intending to do in the improvisation, because I really love when I'm reading your work and I'm also thinking about, you know, towards a vibe and a broad African-based anarch anarchism mm -hmm. that you're writing about, right? So I'm I'm thinking about all of these particular things. And I'm sorry I'm kind of throwing this at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, okay. because you know, there's multiple things that you know you can respond to any of that are, you know, as we come to a close, like I said, I want I want to honor your time. Um, you know, and, and again, you know, hopefully we can, you know, pick back up, you know, in another conversation, but no, if you could respond to any of that, uh, because I'm thinking about your, your, when you say your anarchism and, and pulling on jazz and improvisation, yeah. you know, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. What, one of the things when I wrote, uh, the thing on, uh, towards a vibrant and African based anarchism was, uh, me learning about, um, uh, the, the Yoruba. And in particular, their god Ogun, right? And learn about how Ogun operates. But one of the, the first thing about even putting that out there, people might be like, if you if you're Christian uh, or you come out of the the, um, the Abrahamic religions, you know, you don't want to hear nothing about. Uh, a culture that has Ogun, Bat, uh, Obatala, and all these other folks. But so a part of it was like, we need to be more open to different ways that people experience the world, you know, and not feel like, you know, it's only the way that we see it, you know, stuff like that, get away from like that kind of narrow thinking. But when I learned about Ogun, Ogun will seem to have been this type of a uh, God that like, if he didn't like the, the way things was going, um, he might just disrupt the whole thing. Now, it made me think about an Eldridge Cleaver thing too, around Cleaver, Eldridge Cleaver was like, you know, if the Central Committee ain't, ain't doing his job, then get rid of him, you know? And Ogun seemed to have been that type that he, he was willing to disrupt the process and allow it to be in that period of disruption in order for us to be able to move to a better point, you know? And so for me, I, I kind of saw Ogun in, uh, also based on, um, oh my God, uh, Nigerian writer. Um, Wally, Wally, so Wally, so Wally Soyinka, mm -hmm. right? That he was kind of this anarchist, anarchistic God. But when you're that, you have got to also become aware how you're stuck like you talk about that Western concept of time and be okay if like with the Zapatistas, you, you're in the gathering to make decisions. This ain't no speed thing. We, you know, we ain't on no production line thing here. We, you know, we're trying to get something to happen. That became more important that we accept, like we can take our time, that there are different ways of experiencing time. Um, and also, I think we're even where I'm at now, and it's like I do, I probably do more reading now in um, spirituality, um, even in terms of my, my church is, uh, is a, a Judaic church. And so I, I be reading, not necessarily in my church, do all this reading, but Kabbalah and all this other stuff. But it just allows me to see that how we see ourselves in this world becomes important. And it can't just get solidified that we got to accept being bouncy in a sense we got to accept that there's other things going on there's other you know there may be more than we even understand and that very uh process can help 
um, can help us not fall into, I guess, a one dimensional mindset that we will constantly be open to experiencing our being in this world differently. And at different times, it may look like one way, another time may look like something else. And maybe that also will help us to be able to embrace others who we not used to embracing, but have some kind of, you know, like a manufactured reaction to, you know, and, and in spite of my criticism of uh, Black Lives Matter, I mean, I, I think it was just so great that this, this, this uh, movement was led by women and queer folks. And if they're taking the lead, I don't think it's no different from when we said in the Black Panther Party that the lumpen proletariat was going to be the leaders of the revolution. If we're stepping forward, we're asking you to step into this with us. And if, and if, and if, and if our peoples uh, are asking us to step in now, know that you're stepping in, but you will never come out the same than as when you stepped in. So it means that you've got to have this different relationship with everything, including time, including awareness of bodies, including like uh, the different ways that people can organize their economic and political uh, systems, you know? So for me, that's like, oh yeah, we can do this, mm -hmm. you know? Cause we, ain't, we don't have to be stuck. Mm -hmm. We just gotta be okay with figuring out and we don't have to rush. We don't. In fact, I'm more now on like you're going to get the demonstrations in the streets and all them other things. But man, if we can begin to deal with some of the other internal things, then we can be off the grid in a sense that but it gives us the capacity to build uh, maybe infrastructure that that we need to move forward in a revolutionary movement, you know that is inclusive, that keeps bringing in gifts, that keeps bringing in awarenesses, you know, that there is no one ideology that's gonna do this ideology, period. I'm kind of anti that because it seems that the ideology is supposed to have all the answers. That don't work, but let's be open because in opening, we can really figure out how to make our, our liberation happen. And the Zapatistas would say, Walking, we ask questions. That part has to like stay with us. Don't get stuck. We ain't got the answers to this. We ain't, ain't no people ever been in this situation like us here in this U.S. empire. Mm -hmm. Never. So it's new. It ain't no ain't no roadmap for it. You know. No, thank you for that. And that's actually a good time, good time to pause. But, you know, I, 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 hopefully this doesn't spark another 15, 20 minutes, but I'm also <laughs> thinking about, you know, this notion of, you know, um, African people are not scared of difference. We, we were we were we were made scared to be scared of difference. Or, or mm. So that is yes. something that's very, yes. that's a very uh, a limiting and just have to say a Eurocentric because as 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 the 1492 is happening, coming out of the coming out of the Crusades era, coming out of, you know, when you look at European historiography, once they, as they're moving out and exploring the world, the world is more developed. So this notion of civilization turns on its head, mm -hmm. right? They're looking at the world as being uncivilized. So mm -hmm. that difference created a lot of these particular systems, that fear of difference. And so that's the reason why I say linking it to the imagination of creating things that we, we're still looking at pyramids and some of the 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 architecture and the literature of ancient uh you know civil uh, communities of africa to mm -hmm. this day because they saw a future right so mm -hmm. there is this notion of a an imagination beyond again you know absolutely you could you could respond or we could just say let's put a pin in it and we could catch back up on that no man <laughs> <that> I, <laughs> I, I no i'm i'm good but okay. I, I here's what i want to know where can i read things that you have put out <laughs> oh I will, I will literally i will definitely yes. send them and um i will definitely send stuff but i will definitely uh you know uh because we're dealing with a lot of this through this through this this particular platform right you know we're trying to think what i say think black out loud we're right. trying to think black out loud right. you know 
And also we don't want uh, we don't want to get into a processes of that we're just having these conversations amongst ourselves and not mm -hmm. being open to other people, making it accessible, right. uh, you know, to other people. Because so access is very important to me. Uh, you know, and, and and no no shade on any of uh, of my friends and colleagues and 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 other people who do Patreon because I understand. But one of the things that we want to do or pay one of the things we want to do is to make sure that that, that this is accessible. Um, you know, which goes back into you know some of the ideas and some of the things that you know you and your comrades have been working on. You know, consistently. So, you know, but yeah, I would definitely send a number of, you know, a number of things uh, to you. Yes. And I, and, and one of the reasons, because I'm just your questions and your comments, I'm like, man, I got to stop being depressed, man. <laughs> you, you're, you're like, wow. Yeah. No. And, and so a lot of times, and, and why I want to say this about depression is that there's a lot of wear and tear. I, I, I think for the last few years, I haven't been afraid to even say depressed because I want to win. And when I feel like this, we ain't going to win. It's like, I, uh, but I, but then I realized that there are people like you, Black Men Build, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, uh, uh, Community Movement Builders and others who are doing this work and who are brilliant, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, oh yeah, man, we can win. We can win. No, I appreciate that. And, and, and let me also say, you know, I, I, I try to make sure that we're part of a collective. Mm -hmm. You know, we're working with folk in Kenya. Uh, we definitely connect you with the uh, with the uh, um, organic intellectual young folk in Kenya who are doing the same type of work and making okay. sure, you know. But anyway, uh, okay. we will be in touch. Like I said, we will be in touch. We're definitely pleased. You know, you you left it in good hands. You got, <laughs> but but you're still here, right? <laughs> right. You, on. you guys, are, you guys are our 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 gods. You know, I just want to make sure I publicly say that. You know, from afar and up close. I just want to make sure that you know you know that, and your comrades and colleagues know that as well. So, with that being said, we didn't get a chance to go into uh, you know some of the work with political prisoners that you're doing. Right okay. Now. But yeah. thank you again. Really appreciate thank you. you. You know. Thank you. Um, okay. Right on. Of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward all these things. And when you see that you got problems, all you have to do is examine the historic method used all over the world by others who had problems similar to yours. And once you see how they got theirs straight, then you know how you can get yours straight. Please. There's been a revolution, a black revolution, going on in Africa, in Kenya. The Mau Mau were revolutionaries. They were the ones who made the word Uhuru. They were the ones who brought it to the fore. The Mau Mau, they were revolutionaries. They believed in scorched earth. They knocked everything aside that got in their path. And their revolution also was based on land a desire for land. In Algeria, the northern part of Africa, a revolution took place. The Algerians were revolutionists. They wanted land. France offered to let them be integrated into France. They told the France to hell with France. They wanted some land, not some France. <laughs> and they engaged in a bloody battle. So I cite these various revolutions, brothers and sisters, to show you, you don't have a peaceful revolution. You don't have a, a, a turn the other cheek revolution. There's no such thing as a non-violent revolution. Only thing, only kind of revolution that's non-violent is the Negro Revolution.
The only revolution based on loving your enemy is the Negro Revolution. The only revolution in which the goal is a desegregated lunch counter, a desegregated theater, a desegregated park, and a desegregated public toilet. You can sit down next to white folks on the toilet. That's no revolution. Revolution is based on land. Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. And his own story was as curious as his narrative. The tale of his life is the tale of a writer of incredible vision, an astute analyst and pundit, a lyricist compassionate and callous, a reckless hedonist, and disaffected malcontent. I spit that wonder rhyme of shit. Me and my conglomerates shall remain anonymous, caught up in the finest shit. Get that type of media coverage Obama get. Spit that Kurt Vonnegut. That blow your brain, Kurt Cobain, that Nirvana shit. Who gon' bring the game back? Who gon' spit that rainbow on the train tracks? That gold rope, that five finger ring rap. Running with my same pack. Land is an essential component of liberation. And the value of culture as an element of resistance to foreign domination lies in the fact that culture is the vigorous manifestation on the ideological or idealist plane of the physical and historical reality of the society that is dominated or to be dominated. Culture is simultaneously the fruit of a people's history and a determinant of history by the positive or negative influence which it exerts on the revolution of relationships between man and his environment, among men are groups of men within a society as well as among different societies. An example of these essential components of resistance is found in the Kurdish freedom movement. According to Dilar Dirik in the Kurdish women's movement, history, theory, and practice, the Kurdish freedom movement is a multi-front popular trans-border and internationalist movement that ideologically and organizationally unites genocide survivors, guerrillas, prisoners, workers, politicians, refugees, intellectuals, artists, and youth who organize through local and regional bottom-up assemblies, communes, cooperatives, academies, and congresses. Since one major component of this movement is its armed struggle against NATO member Turkey, its structures are largely criminalized as terrorists by most Western countries. The most radical aspect of this meticulously organized movement is its self-understanding as a women's paradigm. One core tenet that permeates its anti-capitalist and anti-state ideology is that patriarchy is a 5,000-year-old system that can and must be abolished, not through reform, but in a women's revolution, and that the liberation of all society is impossible otherwise. In the perspective of the movement, in a patriarchal world, women's autonomous organization in all spheres of life, from knowledge production to armed self-defense, is a paradigmatic stance and precondition for true democracy. Mansour Tefuri, in The Last Barricade of Revolution, the Kurdish resistance in the Iranian Revolution of 1979, writes, A revolution as a political event and a truth procedure is not in itself the truth but it opens up a space towards the possibility of another world. Any revolution forces us to encounter what we never expected to emerge. That is why revolution always functions as a shock. What you will hear next is our segment titled Poetics of Revolution, Autonomy, Land, and Visions of Freedom, focusing on the long genealogy of the Kurdish freedom movement, specifically exploring the continuities of struggle by examining the Kurdish resistance in the Iranian Revolution of 1979, paying attention to culture, the meaning of autonomy, and the role of land in liberation. Listen intently, think critically, act accordingly.
Taking the time to, you know, have this conversation and think uh, thoroughly through, um, you know, a number of the concepts that we're trying to deal with today, specifically looking at how autonomy uh, is is conceptualized, uh, how autonomy is uh, is fought for, the role of land, and the importance of culture in movements. And of course, we're here today. I'm talking with you about your important work, but also not only work, but this is your life, how you, you know, the the ideas um, that you have paid down, uh, particularly in the 1979, you know, movement that you write about, but also that, of course, that you have connections to, right? You know, so I think that that's very important. So, you know, again, thank you for taking the time to join us today, Mansoor. Thank you, James. I am so glad to be with you in this friendly conversation. And uh, yeah. thanks a lot for your attention for this work and for the Kurdish movement, yeah. um, spe especially this part of this Kurdish movement. I, I will try to, to not explain, but uh, to do something about uh, you know, directly or indirectly in this conversation about what happened in this time. And maybe it is for me better, it is more easy for me, or maybe the first question I must to have uh, answer for that, why this movement in the history? Why in the history till uh, 1980, you know? 
because maybe there are a continuation, uh, something between all the moments. What is what is what permits a researcher to imagine some a, a, a sort of paradigm, political or repetition, or something, some motive, political motive in this movement, named this the movement called all over the uh, all over the world. You know, for me. It is about the notion of uh, event or uh, événement, as uh, theorized or proposed by, suggested by Alain Badiou. What is an event or événement that says something that proposes to the subject to say to them or to show the subject itself that he have or he dispose something more than a power more than the subject itself have imagined. That say, I, I am oppressed. I have not the power. I did, uh, there are no future, no liberation. You know, no hope. But in a, a moment, by grace to to the event, you now uh, we see uh, another horizon, another horizon of the. Possible. Okay, what happened after the in the core of Iranian relation before the shoot of Shah, you know, and after that in Kurdish region named Kurdistan of Iran, you know, uh, for example, uh, all is so simple, so simple, you know. Uh, for example, we have uh, the Farisin, we have the committee, the small committee or small assembly, assembly of the neighborhood in each in each neighborhood. We we, we need the security and we need to the division of the petrol, uh, of the farin, of the breed, you know, of the rice, all this thing, that we need a sort of organization where there are no one, where are not those state, the state, the, uh, the state administration, that, that we need some sort of uh, organization that is that is clear, you know, that is not something so strong. But I mean, the time this uh, committee, this small assembly of the village, of the small district, of the neighborhood, became more and more near, you know, to compose or to construct, for example, the assembly of the cities or assembly of the some village, you know, in a region. And after that, to, to become a more big and vast organization that same the uh, assembly of the Kurdish cities and Kurdish village. You know, but by, by this meeting, by this conversation, by this exchange of idea, the people uh, search or look, look for to establish something that is not a state, you know, that is just assembly, assembly. That say that is not a proclamation for the power, that is not a proclamation to for example, to, to construct a state in the core of the state, you know? But the state couldn't, uh, never, could never accept something non-state in the core of the state. That is the logic of the state, you know? When you want to create or to propose or suggest something in the, something non static in the core of the state, it is uh, more dangerous for the state be attacked by a stronger state you know that is that is it is about a conflict in the uh, inherent in the core of the state what was happened in this time it is uh, from this point of view is important for me but uh, the form for me for me, it is not about the content of this organization. It is about the form that in which or in them, this content, this new content, content realizes itself 
as a form for uh, assembly, for, uh, for example, you know, but after uh, when the assembly was attacked, was attacked by the power of Tehran, you know, by the guardian of the revolution, you know, and where the uh, delegation of the state came to uh, come to the Kurdish region to discuss with the assembly, with the representation of the people delegation, popular delegation and, and the assembly, they have uh, no interest to accept the assembly, okay? And the message is clear, we will attack you, you must to accept the Islamic Republic, the state and the Imam, you know, in the center of hierarchy. You must to accept it. Okay, what we must to do, we have not the, the, the gun, you know, we have not the arm to, to resist. Okay, and, uh, another word, we, we, we don't want to, uh, to, to do all the power to the state. We don't want to accept the state. Okay, the, we must to invent something, something more than, you know. Uh, we need another form of resistance. That's say, that's say I want to say, uh, that is about the form we create in the core of uh, resistance. Okay, the form, the last form or the basic form for me, that is the form of exodus. Something that say we are here, you want to attack our city, okay, uh, let's do it, but you will attack. You will attack, or I will give you a city without the population, without the inhabitant, you know, with the people. You have, you have nothing. We, ha we have no citizen in this, uh, in this city. Okay, we, we propose the, the people, the, the assembly, for example, the Mary one proposed to the people, we will go, we will go out, we will exodus, you know, we will do make an exodus nearby, nearby the city, but we are not in the city, you know? And, and somehow uh, for two weeks, we have another sort of organization of uh, uh, political life, you know, that say, that is a life, but, it is in the same time, it is not a, a natural life, you know, it is not a bare life. That is a political choice and the creation of another form of a collective life together. A, a, another sort, if uh, I could say, another sort of community, not, you know, not so society, you know, that is, that is, a, that is a difference. Okay. In, in, in this two, two weeks, you know, we, we need, uh, okay, we need the water, we need the bread, we need the, the medi medical uh, service, we need the, all the things that we need in the everyday life. We need the bi bibliotheque, you know, we need the library, we need all the things, we need the newspaper, we need the media, we need the connection between the people. You know, we must to cook and we need all the things. We have no thing. You know, in the Exodus, we came from the Egypt, you know. We came from the Egypt in the core of the desert. We need, we need, we need our organization. Okay, what, what, let's do it. Okay, we call, we send the delegation to the other city. You know, we, we call them by telephone. We need the help. Where are you? You know, we need the help. And from the another Kurdish village and cities and from and all some other cities of Iran, the help came to this uh, desert, to this exodus, you know? And we create, we create another sort of, uh, for example, house, you know, by the trees, you know, nearby the trees, okay. But uh, for me, the, the thing interesting, for example, there are many things to, to speak about. For example, about the economy, you, you post me, you want me, you ask me about the economy, what is the economy? Okay, there are, for sure, there are a sort of economy. But that is in the real sense of economy, you know, that say, that say the art to administrate our house, <laughs> you know, not as capital. There are not capital, you know, or somehow there are not the money, you know, there are not the money. We need the money that say all the people, 
give the, the things that we have, you know, to all the people. And there are some committee, committee, committee of vegetable, committee of uh, of meal, committee of water, committee of uh, uh, medical committee, committee of education, committee of uh, propaganda, committee of you know information, and the committee of uh, speaking uh, with the with the state, with the delegation of the state. Let's say you know. And we do it, uh, you know, each time that is, that is like a, a great creation, a possibility of creation. And we could create all that we need. Okay, they say to us, you know, it is not possible to live with the uh, old capitalism, you know. There is no issue, there is, there is no exist or issue from the capitalism. But somehow this example show us and showed us in the time that it is possible to live collectively and politically or create a place politic, a politic space out of the capitalist relationship and out of uh, the domination relationship between some sort of people. Let's say uh, that is the only example maybe that we could speak about the people. Let's say this example show us that from the multiple, from the different people, from the different kush and uh, social class, we could create another thing, another entity that is the that could be called the people. And for me, from this event, we could speak about the Kurdish people in the political signification. You know, in, 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 in that's sure. Before this event, before this event, we have we have the Kurdish people. But what was the relationship or the rapport between the, this individual? You know, I am Kurd, you are Kurd, but it is no thing collective uh, or politic between us. And by this event, a people became a people for itself or create itself as a political entity. That is what's uh, interesting for me in this moment. And this moment uh, showed us, all the Iranian people, the another possibility to create, you know, but that is something strange and that, he, that could be something really uh, dangerous, you know, when we want to create another entity that is not a state, but in the core of the state, you know, if we could, they, they could, they could proclaim, for example, you are a state, okay, you could be attacked so easily. But when you speak about another form and you think about another song, that could be more critical, you know, critical for the state. Uh, that is uh, why I chose, you know, this moment, this moment. Uh, There's the, the, something, something so strange for me is that what uh, that is or was uh, when uh, I want to interview the, the witness or the activists of this thing, they say to me, but that is past. What you speak about, what you speak about, they have no thing to speak about, you know? Only I, I could say, but for, for them, you know, the importance of this moment or of this moment in the history was not clear. You know, after my research, there are some another researcher or witness that uh, started uh, that have started to to speak about their experience you know but it is about that uh, if you want i could uh, for example i i found a newspaper from this time you know uh, that is about a report uh, published in 10 uh, august in this time you know 1970 you know the rapport 
you want her to to hire audit? Well, absolutely. Go ahead and read that. And and I just wanted to make sure that as our listeners and everybody's loud this, you were explaining what led to this revolt to 1979 and this idea that an autonomous region, uh, another structure was created by Kurdish people in this particular region. And this was a threat to the nation state, the overall structure or the threat to the power of the particular state. So you're talking about how to create an autonomous uh, region within and what was that relationship, uh, particularly in 1979. So I just wanted to make sure, you know, because you mentioned capitalism, you mentioned that an economy was developed as an alternative to capitalism. I, I, am I correct in, in pulling that out of what you were just saying? But to develop your idea, uh, I will need to explain in some phrase about what happened, you know. Uh, Shah, uh, you know, upon on a uh, legitimacy, you know, legitimation by the history, historical legitimation, and, you know, holy legitimation. Let's say they come, I am chose, you know, I have chose by the God, you know. What happened, what happened in the, in the core of Iranian revolution, you know, for the Islamists, for the Islamists, not for the another power, another another group, but, but for for the Islamists uh, that say the Y of Khomeini, you know, the militant or the partisan of the Y of Khomeini, they say they call themselves in this time, you know, there was the intellectual, there, there was the anti-capitalist, you know, there was anti um, especially anti-imperialist, you know, they said, but Khomeini, for example, we can, for example, for, for a part of left uh, and anti amp uh, for Khomeini was someone anti-imperialist that we must to support Khomeini, you know. But for the Khomeini was was the project. The project was to be get supreme. That say Shah go, okay, it is finished. But we need some some another one in this place. That see, it is about the place, you know. It is the place. It's about a chair, you know. It is not about for them something emancipatory or something revolutionary. I need this place. I want to govern, I want, I want to rule, not in the name of history, but in the name of God and the hierarchy and the, you know, holiness that I have. I choose by the God, you know, you know, that say the, 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 the displacement for them that was not the displacement between some sort of organization. No, you know, for them, uh, between me and another one. So very simple, very, that was very simple. Uh, really, okay. But in the idea, what is that? What is that about? About the relation of this uh, governor or uh, uh, sovereignty or sour to the life in general? You know, to all the property that exists in a territory, all belong to the Shah. Okay, in all the theory, you know. But now upon the religion all belong, the life, the subject, the corpse, all the what is in the territory belong to the imam. And there are a theory for, for that, you know, there are a theory that say this theory come back to the, to the uh, nation, nations or the birth of the political economy in Islam, you know. Where, where is this moment? There are a moment, you know, James, in the time of uh, Muhammad, prophet, the prophet, as uh, the hagiograph, as the historian, no, I'm not sure that was Muhammad that say that, you know, but we have a figure of Muhammad constructed by the militants and the theorists or jurisprudence of the power of the Khalifa, of the Imam, you know, there are uh, at last two Muhammad, okay, someone, someone from uh, Messianic tradition and uh, someone that belong to the jurisprudence, that uh, the Muhammad, that the power, need, you know, in, in a moment in the birth of Islam for them, there are uh, the property that is harem, that is sacred. We have not to appropriate it or proclaim the belonging of the nature 
or of the life to the sour, to the governor, to the imam, or to the shah, as you, as, as you want to name it, you know. But, you know, for the Khomeini, there are a theory in the history, in the jurisprudence that legitimize to, uh, to dominate all the things that is in a territory, you know? Okay, uh, the, that is a sort of capitalism, a sort of capitalism that say, or belong to the governor, or governor Bisha, or it could be Imam or Khalifa, you know? That is the theory of Daesh, that is all the theory in the uh, Muslim world, the sour proclaim, the proclaim the power and the life upon on this theory, in the name of this theory. Mm. Because in this time, in the belt of Islam, there, there are a verse, verse of uh, phrase of Quran that say, now we will legitimize for you, we will make licit or legitimate something that was haram or illegitimate for another people. And from this point, that is my power for you, God say, I, I choose you and I have a more power for you. Your power is that you have the right, you are lawful to appropriate the life and all the seeing that was haram for in the tradition for another, for another people, you know? Upon us, this theory, the governor, the imam have the right, have the right on the lives. Uh, could you imagine? Or maybe I am not clear, you know, maybe I need more phrase, more in English, in English, you know, uh, it could be better to, for me, for example, to speak about that in French or uh, unfortunately in French <laughs> or in Kurdish, you know, or in Farsi, in Persian. Okay. Uh, uh, let's do it. Uh, what I wanted to say, that is what happened in this time, you know, in this time, that is this place of governor, the place of Khomeini, this place of imam. Who won, the one who is in this place, have this right to make legitimate, to confiscate the life, to kill the life, and all the things. And that is in the name of this right, and by this right that they govern. Uh, from this point of view, you know, we have a sort of capitalism in Islam, political Islam, Islam politics, not cultural Islam. That is some, another thing, you know, for example, what is uh, uh, cultural Islam? That is my mother, you know, for me, uh, for the he, she said, or she say in prayer, you know, uh, I wanted to hear, Mama, what, you, what is that, your religion? What you do in your prayer? What you say with someone I, invisible? What you do? Hey, my guy, let me, let me, let me do it. It is about do the good and don't do the bad, you know? To be gentle, to be merciful for the people, to be respectful for another, that is all the thing, you know? That is, a, that is for me is culturally, to be Muslim culturally and to be Muslim politically, it is another thing, you know? That the problem is the, to be Muslim politically, that say Islamist is different from Muslim and, in some way, yes, I came from a Muslim family, you know, not from an Islamist family. That is another thing, you know. But in this story, you must to obey. That is about that. You must to obey the governor because he is sacred, he is holy. He came from the God, he legitimation, he powerful, came from the God. And you must to accept, you know, the delegation, the, 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 uh, the home speaker of the delegation of Tehran said in the time to the delegation of the courts in Marijuana, in the same time, you know, but if you are Muslim, you must to accept the Imam. That is a condition. 
if you don't accept the imam and the power of imam, you are not Muslim. You know, you will be excluded from the community, from the ummah, you know, from the community Muslim. That is about that. To understand uh, more clearly what happened in, in this part of the world, you must to know this theory. You know, you must, uh, and some who don't accept, you know, the power or the legitimacy of the Imam could be excluded. He could be homosexual, you know, could be homosexual. Uh, and homosexual, soccer in, in, in Islam, in Jewish program in Islam, that, that say haram, you know, haram, something that came from the, uh, Hebrews or Jewish law, you know, that is the case of case of Espinoza that have put in the that was put in.